The, the P-51, ever since I was a kid, has been one of my favorite airplanes. I sat there as a kid in Carlsbad, California, watching my dad fly uh, a Mustang uh, routinely. And it just became one of my favorite airplanes. You know, it looks all business, whether it's on the ground, not even running, or going by on a high-speed pass. It just, it is the, is the most gorgeous airplane that I, I think has ever been created. A P-51 to me is like a, a beautiful woman. If she walks by, you're going to look at her, if you're a male. I mean, it's, it's not betraying anyone, you're just going to look at it. When a P-51 goes by, you are going to look at it. I don't care if you're a welder, if you're a bricklayer, if you're a priest. When a Mustang goes by, you're going to take notice. They are beautiful. The earliest recollection of seeing my dad work was in Carlsbad, California. I was a kid. My favorite hobby back then was to make airplanes out of refrigerator boxes. Uh, I was probably four, three, four, somewhere in that area, and I remember him running the single Yoder hammer that he had in the corner, making parts and also working on various warbirds, whether it be Corsairs or Mustangs, T-28s, Bearcats, Hellcats, you name it. He had it in the shop, and I was around it 24 7. It was just that's what ingrained it in my DNA and my very first thing was him running the other hammer and having warbirds nearby. I became a P-51 aficionado early on. I love the aircraft. It loves me. It's taken care of me and I've always wanted to create the P-51. Not to upstage anyone, not to make anyone feel bad as though it were a contest. I just wanted to build what I thought was the most beautiful, beautiful airplane in the world. And by virtue of the talents that I worked on and that I'd learned through working at Lockheed with Harold Dickey and all the other people we've covered, um, those that mentored me also really, really supplemented my love for craftsmanship and anal about the way things look and fit. The P-51, unfortunately, was a war effort airplane. In their production, it was the most beautiful metal craftsmanship you've ever seen on any of the World War II fighters built in the United States. The craftsmanship on the Mustang was the finest. They built just under 10,000 Ds. Scott could tell you the exact number. And by the time they got up to the last batch of about a thousand of them, they were beautiful. But the skin fit in a lot of areas in it. They just were still put together. One rolled off the line every 43 seconds. Between the two final assembly lines, a Mustang rolled off the line at the height of production every 43 seconds. That's a true statistic. You can imagine the clamoring and the crawling over top of each other trying to get these airplanes done for final assembly. The concept of the aircraft that eventually became Quicksilver began in around uh, 1990. We moved to West Virginia in 1994, and the aircraft flew in, uh, in, in, in 2000 and, and early 2000s. April Fool's Day was its first test flight of uh, April of 07. So do the math. Uh, the actual construction period was approximately 16 years from start to finish. Uh, that was 16 years of still occurring parts, still talking to the uh, eight or 10 keepers of knowledge, as I call them, who helped talk me through the stuff I didn't know. By the time I moved back to West Virginia in 94, I had a, a, a pretty good pile of parts for Mustangs, stuff that I knew were gingerbread parts and hard to find. So then I purchased a kit from a guy who had the unruly Julie wreck. It crashed on its first test flight in Chino. And I bought that entire wreckage, little of which did we use, except the lingerons out of the fuselage. So <clears throat> I began building the airplane. Over the period of 16 years, the aircraft was in construction. Uh, while I occurred the parts, a lot of the parts that weren't gettable, that were not securable, I had the entire portfolio of drawings. Bob Odegaard and Jerry Beck and myself went together and we put the entire portfolio of drawings for the P-51 series aircraft on eight CD-ROMs. $150,000 later we had them 
and there were seven of us that went in a joint venture and ended up with the eight CDs amongst the, each of us, so we had all the drawings for the Mustang. So I could legally make parts, especially for a one-time aircraft. The only thing was I couldn't put part numbers on them. So we tried to find as many parts as we can with part numbers. The aircraft is about 70%. It has part numbers. This aircraft was in various fixtures around the hangar that you see here. And one of the fixtures was the wing. The wing was together. The left and right wing were, were together. And it was in a uh, fixture where it, was, where it was resting on its leading edge up off the ground, but the leading edge was pointed towards the ground. So the sides that you saw were the top and the bottom of the wing. Um, we used to, in the wintertime, when I was in junior high and high school, play basketball for the school and a lot of times we would help practice in the hangar here and not having a defined out of bounds marker we used the wing at the time and there were several times where the ball would go out of bounds and bounce on the wing and all of this all of these memories were repressed until the first time I ever did vertical aerobatics in Quicksilver and I'm looking out of the wing and the very first thing I think about is the basketball bouncing off the left wing and I'm sitting there I was like well I'm glad it didn't hurt it and I'm glad it's rubber. So over a 16-year period, this aircraft was constructed. Many skins were fit and thrown away because I wanted the skin fit to be perfect. Actually, I made a mistake. I made the skin fits too tight on two places on the wing, and I had to end up modifying the, the ammo bay doors because they were fit so tight that when Scott started doing air shows, when he'd do a high-G pull, it would crowd those doors. It was starting to tuck the skins a little bit, so we had to make an alteration there. I had them too fit, too tight. If you look at the aircraft, you'll see... It was fit by a guy who's anal about how skins should fit. Uh, with regard to the fillets you were talking about, there's nowhere on the airplane you can take a card and get under any of the fillets. They fit that tight. I did that in memory of the engineers that designed this beautiful bird and tried to build one that would become their talents and give this airplane a chance to be built without a rush, without a war effort construction, and that's what we did. So we built Quicksilver, and in the interim, I had a wonderful partner and angel who helped me financially get this project done because he was a believer. I had worked for him many years on other projects, Mr. Paul Hunter, and uh, of the Hunter Irrigation uh, family. And Paul was a very successful businessman. And so from him came the... Uh, adequate amount of cubic yards of money to do this and uh, he 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 did it without a second thought ever and he helped me create one of the most beautiful airplanes in the world in my opinion we decided what are we going to do with it you know how do we he wanted it I don't want it painted I want to show your metal work off and I fought that tooth and nail I don't want a polished airplane I don't want a polished hubcap much less a polished airplane well we're going to polish it well how do you say to a guy that's just spent upwards of $3 million to build an airplane with me to say, no, we're not doing that. So I caved. I said, let me design a paint scheme on a, on a theme that, that I would always want to do. I was not a veteran. I was a young, cocky, 15-hour commercial pilot during Vietnam. And I wanted to fly. I didn't have that BA or BS degree, and I took that heavy. And I said, hell with it. And I didn't go in the military. I lost a lot of friends in Vietnam. And I swore that one day I'd make it up. So I told Paul, I said, I'd like to dedicate this airplane to all those who have served this country in the armed forces. And I've got a paint job that'll knock you down. And I sent him the prototype and he said, do it. The very first flight, I was still in uh, Air Freedom Power Plant School down at Daytona Beach. And uh, I was in the last round of my airframe classes and an electrical class of all things. And I got a text from my mom saying that dad was in the air. Obviously, I thought he was in the air in some other airplane. It says, dad's in the air in the Mustang, very next text. And I look and I'm like, well, not our Mustang, it can't be, that thing wasn't that close to flying. Very next text is, he's on the ground safely, some minor problems, nothing too bad. So I call him during our break, and sure enough, he had flown it, and I thought it was a joke. I thought it was an April Fool's joke because it was around the 1st of April that he did the first flight. I couldn't believe it. I, he didn't even tell me a couple of days prior that he was going to do it. He just one day just jumped in it and flew. <laughs> it, was, it was ready, and he, why wait? So he did.
its maiden voyage was to Oshkosh. And when we broke ground, lightning hit about 30 feet behind the airplane and blew a chunk out of the runway that big as we were taken off. I mean, the trip for Oshkosh was never meant to be. We had an, uh, we had a, a, an issue with fuel pressure indication right over Charleston, West Virginia. We circled down through an overcast, did a landing, fixed it, got halfway between here and Oshkosh, nothing but weather. Uh, up at uh, Crossbows or whatever it is, um, um, uh, restricted area, two F-16s formed up on us and flew us through the thunderstorms, escorted us with radar so that we told approach we could not go through driving rain or we'd lose all the paint on the leading edges. And we got led through and talked with two F-16s that drove us through these towering QEs to keep us out of the weather turned us loose. I looked over and one guy in the cockpit is sitting there with his camera photographing the airplane about 10 feet off our wing. And uh, God was with us on that trip. The good Lord was with us. And we got to Oshkosh and were well received. We taxied in. And when people saw the aircraft, a couple Mustangs left because they heard we were going to show, which we did not intend to show. The routine generally is that I'll walk around the airplane first. Dad usually walks behind me or maybe slightly in front of me as we pre-flight the aircraft. And as I get up on top of the wing, he will put my parachute on. He'll help me put my parachute on. My helmet will be sitting on the glare shield right in front of the, uh, of the windscreen. And I get in the aircraft, I strap in, he helps me strap in, puts my helmet on, he takes my head and puts it in his chest and hugs me and says, come back to dad, always. That's what he always says. Mm -hmm. uh, he gets down off the wing and uh, he kneels in front of the aircraft and says a little prayer in front of it. Uh, he's done that since day one, since 2007 when this airplane first flew. He's done that ever since. And uh, that, I think that's one of the things we're known for in the air show circuit is him kneeling down in front of the airplane. It's, it's kind of like one of our staples. The reason why he kneels down in front of the aircraft is because when I first started flying uh, the P-51, not just Quicksilver, when I got checked out when I was 20 years old, one of the first things he showed me was his, was his phone book. And his phone book has red lines in it through people. And it's people that have died over the years. And as we were going through, we counted 14 very close friends that had died in a P-51, not just airplanes, in a P-51. And he let it known that this airplane is by no means just a fighter. It is a for real fire-breathing dragon. And it will bite you at the least, when you least expect it. So... You always have to be on your A-game. There's no such thing as complacency in a P-51. There can't be. There's no room for it. I kneel in front of the airplane every time it flies to bring my son home in the airplane. And up to date, we've had great success with Quicksilver. We love her. She treats us good. We treat her good. And uh, though she is just a intrinsic machine, uh, she has become a very, very important family member. We hashed around and hashed around with names. Uh, Silver Stallion, we came up with all kind of names. Uh, part and partial to the uh, dedication uh, phase of the aircraft to our um, uh, veterans and service people, Quicksilver wasn't there yet. And we wanted to call it the Resurrected Veteran, which it is called. That's its theme, the Resurrected Veteran. But we wanted a name. And so through the evolutionary process of culling out different names, Quicksilver ran out. When you strap, when you strap that airplane to you, you get in the cockpit, put the straps on, it becomes a part of you. It almost fits like a T-shirt. And once that, once that Merlin wakes up, really, I mean, it's... It's game on. You really have to, everything from systems management to just plain old keeping the airplane straight and keeping it happy at all times. It's a full-time job, and your, you, your mind can't waver. Your mind can't be out of the cockpit in any way, shape, or form. It has to be on task at all times. You have to put your A game on, and you have to focus. The only name on the aircraft other than the standalone uh, emblem on the tail, the North American Eagle, uh, is Scott's name because he's deserved his name on the aircraft. The other name is the name of the gentleman who was killed in the primary wreckage that the aircraft is built around. We ended up with a data plate off an airplane that's in the bottom of the Puget Sound. And uh, the gentleman who was killed in that aircraft, his name is uh, belovingly on the left-hand gear door.
When I found out that I was flying on Bob Hoover Day at EAA's Oshkosh Air Venture in 2011, it was, I decided that I would have to go all out, that it would have to be the best I've ever flown, and it would also have to probably have some sort of honorary theme to it. So uh, Father and I decided that I would, uh, I would dress in a shirt and tie, wear a, wear a straw hat, and uh, I'd fly the routine as Bob did, minus, minus the torque roll and takeoff. I, I think that's probably better left to uh, <laughs> uh, Mr. Hoover himself that, that perfected it, and, uh, and the Tennessee Waltz, just because uh, it does wear out over time. It does wear out the down locks, and we're trying to take care of this airplane the best we can. So what I did was I did his routine, minus those two maneuvers, and it, it turned out very well. And it, was a, it was a big honor just to fly in the same airspace as him sitting and watching. It was by far the pinnacle of my career. Dad came back and he literally had tears in his eyes. He said that was the best you've flown and the best I've seen you fly. And I don't think a more fitting tribute to Bob could have been flown. All of this is important because not only are we preserving history by flying a national relic, but we're also demonstrating it in a very dynamic and very interesting way in front of the crowd, inspiring a future generation, which hopefully I will do, uh, to fly as my father and the other air show performers that have, that have come before me have. It's just kind of a way of repaying, repaying the industry, repaying the air show community. I think one of the best things that you can do is ensure the future generation of not only air shows but aviation. Some of this may still be classified, I don't know, but I know the SR-71 and the TR-2 have both been declassified. So I'm treading on thin ice giving you stuff about Area 51, but the food in jail is pretty good, so I don't care. I finished school in West Virginia, high school, went back out seeking my fortune in California. My stepfather wanted me to come back out there. And I went out there and was instantly hired at Lockheed Aircraft in Burbank, California. I was there for just under seven years. Um, during that tenure at Lockheed, I was able to rub shoulders with some really wonderful people. Uh, I was accepted into the apprenticeship program about a year and a half after I hired on for the Research and Development Mechanic Apprenticeship Program, which was a great honor. Out of uh, 680 applicants, they chose 30. And these people were selected by virtue of their uh, knowledge and talent and their, and their desire to be in the aviation industry. Fortunately, I was one. I was selected as one of the Research and Development Mechanic Apprentice candidates. And that apprenticeship lasted just under six years. 
during that tenure, I worked in every phase of the construction of aircraft, final assembly, making parts, uh, going from department to department, coming intimately involved in the construction of aircraft and design. I also worked in some areas at Lockheed that were uh, intimately involved in the support of the black aircraft, namely the SR-71, the uh, TR-2. And uh, those particular uh, departments, uh, I was very, very infatuated with being able to work on such aircraft. They were truly magic carpets. And was later on, uh, the last three years, I was accepted. There were three of us that actually passed the security test. Kelly Johnson wanted new blood in the black area. And so I had the pleasure and honor of meeting Kelly Johnson. The three of us were accepted after we passed a strenuous um, security investigation. We were given a small luncheon. We were all three given a cup a plus three cup. It uh, shows a picture of an SR-71 and it says three plus. The airplane actually went 4.4. But anyway, uh, and we were given an SR-71 pin. And those were given to us in the cup by Killarence Johnson. He came to the luncheon. He smoked a cigarette. He was a heavy smoker. And he talked to us for a few minutes and gave us a pep rally as to we were the first and the leading edge of the young blood of the new people coming into Area 51, welcomed us and, ex and excused himself because he was a very, very busy man. Never saw him again. But I did, I sat next to Tony Levere. Tony Levere had a running um, application for me for over four years. I wanted to fly for Tony Levere. We weren't really well accepted because uh, the people that worked in Area 51 were old timers and they weren't up for nonsense and young blood and stuff like that. So we really had a lot of pressure on us. I went to home every evening scared to death that the FBI was going to be knocking on my door, hauling me away because we were threatened with our lives that if we opened our mouth about anything we saw, did, or were involved in, it would, uh, it would result in severe punishment. And uh, I took that very seriously. I usually spent about a week up there. They would bring me home for the weekends. We would brief prior to getting on the airplane. We would brief prior to after getting off the airplane, and we would debrief before we left. They watched us like hawks because we were young blood and and uh, we were uh, treading on hallowed territory. I used to wake up and get there early in the morning. We'd leave Burbank at three in the morning and go to Area 51. They'd close the windows on the airplane so they thought we didn't know where we were going and where we were. And we would land there just about sun up, and I would get off the aircraft and look down the runway and at those beautiful mountains, the, the Papoose Mountains, and uh, uh, think that I am the luckiest guy in the world to be here because everything there was magic. It really was. And it was still in a time period where uh, not only your infatuation took over, but the fact of how lucky you were to be able to rub shoulders with the people. We lived in Quonset huts out there. Uh, in uh, Some of the uppity guys lived in what we called the VOQ. They kept us in little Quonset huts where we lived and uh, did our thing. And we had the walk of the place, except we couldn't go where we didn't have the proper numbers and letters on our badge. By virtue of having to be able to work back there, my first assignment was on the chase airplane, the F-104. I really didn't get to touch any of the Blackbirds for a while. And the only reason I got back there was because of a wonderful gentleman named... Um, his name slips me now, but I, uh, Frank Torres, he, uh, I was a crew chief with him on the Cheyenne helicopter during its development and so forth. And I also crewed the uh, Lockheed 286 a demo helicopter that Lockheed had built. It was the first helicopter to do acrobatics and so forth. Uh, I worked between two places, Area 51 and a place they called the Fort. The Fort was down in Burbank where they did uh, high security testing of some of the, um, for instance, the Spike um, actuators were, were, were tested in this place. They also tested the ejection seats. They shot them up in the air and caught them in a net. And uh, also, uh, there was a project that, that was later on with the SR-71s. They developed cracks up under the wings in some pretty critical areas. In each airplane, the cracks were indigenous. They weren't in the same places. So they designed a box that would go on the outside of the outside of the lower belly, and they had a hard point. They bolted this box on. It had cameras. It was water cooled. Uh, it had a coolant system in it, and I helped in the design creation of the box, 
with a guy named George Buck Buchanan, who was a thermodynamicist at Lockheed, and I was very intimately involved for about six months in the design, conception, and construction of that box and its final implementation and being fitted onto aircraft. The aircraft were brought over from Beale to Area 51. The box was put on. Daryl Greenmeyer would fly the aircraft and get them hot, and they would photograph these cracks up under the wings, and then they would design indigenous field repair kits for each airplane. And then it was brought up, they were put on at Lockheed. The Air Force did very little maintenance on those airplanes. Anytime you are, are gifted enough that you qualify, and I don't say that uh, uh, as a braggart, but it requires certain talents to be able to be accepted to work in those areas, but mostly it's your intelligence level and do you contribute? Uh, you were a team player at Area 51 and at Lockheed. You were not an individual. If you were not a team player, you didn't participate, especially in the black area. They still have that creed. Uh, a team player tends to go with security. So, uh, yes, it was high security. It was a real pleasure, but it was, it had its, I had a lot of fear put in me about talking when I shouldn't. And it took me many, many years to get over that. There were friends, very intimate friends of mine, up until recently did not know where I worked. I never told people. There have been many famous contenders for the coveted title of champion fighter aircraft of World War II. But few could match the knockout punch delivered by the P-51 Mustang. Mustang pilots dominated the series of Olympic air battles fought over Germany, which finally destroyed Hitler's mighty Luftwaffe. His unique blend of superb handling, high performance, devastating firepower, and long-range endurance made the Mustang unbeatable. It was the finest, as far as I'm concerned. For many, the P-51 Mustang remains the ultimate fighter aircraft. It's one-to-one -one combat, and you got to be aggressive. If you think you're going to be defensive in a fighter plane, you're lost. I wanted to be the tip of the spear. I thought that was the right place to be. We sold you on almost alone. We did know, I think, what we wanted, and we had some super brains who were ordering these things. We knew what we wanted, and we got it. In the late summer of 1940, Britain's Royal Air Force was locked in the deadly struggle with Germany's Luftwaffe, which became known as the Battle of Brooking. The situation was critical. The British Spitfire and Hurricane fighters were good machines, but they were not being built fast enough to meet the threat of a German invasion. One solution was to import fighters from America. The North American Aviation Company had the basis of the new high-performance, long-range fighter design already on the drawing board. After just 117 days, they rolled out the finished airframe. It was a sleek and streamlined machine, which reached 382 miles per hour during early test flights making it faster than the British Spitfire at low altitude, despite carrying twice as much fuel, which gave it twice the rent. <laughs> but of high altitude, its Anderson engine lost power, and it took almost twice as long as the Spitfire to reach 20,000 feet. Although it was unsuited to high-altitude combat, its high speed and long range made it the ideal weapon for low-level ground attack missions. The RAF placed an order for 620 of the new aircraft 
which it christened a Mustang. That's a wild horse, isn't it? Um, it didn't have wild traits. It was a good aeroplane. And, uh, but Mustang is, I mean, everybody would like a good Mustang horse. Yes, good name for it. This is the Mustang, the fastest army cooperation aircraft in the world. They've already been in action, ground strafing the enemy in the Axis-occupied countries across the English Channel. The RAF pilots like them. German soldiers in northern France do not. And the Americans showed surprisingly little interest in the potent new weapon they had developed for the RAF. They had no wish to be drawn into the war that was devastating Europe. But in December 1941, the whole course of World War II was changed as Japan attacked Pearl Harbor and America entered the war. It was agreed that defeating Hitler in Europe would be the first priority for the Allied forces. Britain had narrowly escaped one invasion, but now there came another, a friendly invasion, as thousands of American troops poured into Britain to help defeat fascism. Among them were young airmen, fresh out of training, full of confidence and itching to get into the fight, whatever the risks. Now look, fellas, let's face it. This is our business. In war, there's only one place for you to be, on your toes. You know, a fighter pilot basically is an individualist. Nobody has any ego in his family because he has it all. Did you pipe that fair weather pilot telling me? I can handle this. I was young and uh, cocky, too. In fact, um, a conceited son of a bitch. <laughs> no, I, I thought I was pretty good. In fact, uh, you probably never heard of a pilot that didn't think he was the number one fighter pilot in the world. I, hell, I've met thousands of them. To stay alive, you've got to act alive. It's the deed that counts, not what you say. It's the deed. Your actions. Learn and live. If you don't, you won't. You're going to come in combat against someone else, you know you're going to beat them. If you don't have that feeling, if you think you're going to be defensive in a fighter plane, you're lost. If you don't think you're a winner, you're in the wrong business. OK? OK. The Americans certainly needed all the confidence they could get if they were to defeat the battle-hardened pilots of the Luftwaffe, they were about to enter the big league of air fighting. Well, we certainly know where we are now. Young cadets in full parade. The youthful hope and pride of the Army Air Forces. And we mean it. Yes, they're the best young flying blood in the world. And America was equally proud of the playing Zegward Islam. America's newest fighter plane, the P-47 Thunderbolt, has left the drafting boards and is now in mass production. One of the main contenders for the title of Top Gun American Fighter was the P-47 Thunderbolt. It was a massive machine, which tipped the scales at more than eight tons. Thousands of rounds of ammunition are stored in its wings. Guns are tested on the ground. Thunderbolts in name, they pack Thunderbolts of firepower. At low level, the Thunderbolt's weight limited its performance. But the higher it got, the better it flew. And at altitude, it was more than a match for the German fighters. But the Thunderbolt's huge engine gulped few at the rate of more than one gallon every 30 seconds, which severely limited its range. And range was the key to victory in the European air war. What America badly needed was a fighter which could escort its bombers from their bases in Britain all the way to the German capital, Berlin. In the summer of 1943, the Allies launched a combined bombing offensive against Nazi Germany. It was a 24-hour operation. The British bombed by night, the Americans by day.
The American campaign had been based on the belief that the heavily armed flying fortress and liberator bombers could defend themselves against attacking German fighters. But the daylight raid suffered heavy losses, and it soon became obvious that the bombers needed the protection of a fighter escort. The prime targets were the centers of German industrial production and the capital city, Berlin, 550 miles from the American bases in southeast England. Most escort missions were entrusted to the heavyweight Thunderbolts, which would fly to the limit of their radius of action, about 200 miles from base. By adding extra fuel tanks, the range was increased to more than 300 miles, still well short of Berlin. Their sole task was to project the bombers, and under the dynamic leadership of celebrated pilots like Colonel Don Blakesley, the Americans began to earn a formidable reputation as aggressive fighters. Don Blakesley was sort of a fighter pilot god on a pedestal. Everybody knew who he was, and he was a great leader. Colonel Don Blakesley, great leader of 4th Group. I actually liked the business. It's probably a horrible thing to say, but I, I got a hell of a good kick out of it, particularly when you're winning. My feeling was, if you see it, you go after it. Just aggressive. Just be aggressive. And uh, it worked. A German soon learned to respect these formidable fighters. But they also learned to exploit their limited range. As we were going in and we were reaching our maximum range, you could see the Germans out there circling, waiting. They knew exactly when we had to go. Just when they were needed most, the Thunderbolts were forced to turn for home or risk running out of fuel. Now the bomber crews were on their own, knowing that the Jan fighters were lying in wait for them. That was rather disheartening when you saw them turn back because you knew you were going to catch it from then on. And as soon as we would leave, you could look back and you could see the tangling going on. And this was a horrible sight. And there was nothing we could do. Fighters at 6 o'clock. This is what a gunner sees. A speck in the sky. That's a fighter. And then a blink. That means he's firing at you. 2,300 rounds a minute. You see those leading edges light up like neon signs, and you know that they're shooting at you, and they, and they mean business. They must have got a direct hit on the bombs, because there was an explosion, little pieces of tinsel falling down, and a smoke ring started to form. and. By the time we got out, the smoke ring was still in the air. That's all there was left of him. Sad. That kind of thing was dreamlike, to see this panorama of destruction in the sky and little dots sometimes jumping out of the bombers. People, guys, jumping out. Some chutes opening, sometimes you see a dot disappear. Just the dot. Come on, you guys, get out of that plane. Bail out. There's one, he come out of the bomb bay. Yeah, I see him. There's a tail gunner coming out. Right in front of me, his tail gunner bailed out, and he didn't have his chute snapped on. And he had it in his hand, but the slipstream took it away from him. And I, I saw him fall. And, uh, he had to go 26,000 feet with no visible means of support. Uh, the only thing I could think of, well, he's got plenty of time to say his prayers on the way down. Those bomber crews were brave men. What they did, I would not want to do. The only time that you feel miserable, as far as I was concerned, 
is when I watched the bombers going down and you couldn't do a darn thing about it. And you know they're not gonna make it. And it is the most disheartening experience. Sometimes you come back and you're practically in tears. You knew that there are 10 guys in there that aren't going to be home that night. And there was nothing I, as a fighter pilot, could do about it. The need for long-range fighter escorts was proved beyond any doubt on the 17th of August, 1943. During raids on Schweinfurt and Regensburg, 60 aircraft, each with a crew of 10 men, were lost. During a single week in October, 148 bombers and 1,500 crew members failed to return from bombing missions. The operation was too costly to sustain. If the American bombing campaign over Germany was to succeed, an effective long-range fighter had to be found. A few people were convinced that the answer lay with the neglected Mustang. It had the range, it had the speed, it had the firepower. All it needed was the ability to fight at high altitude. Back in 1942, a team of Rolls-Royce engineers had tried replacing the Mustang's Allison engine with their Merlin, the engine that powered the British Spitfire. Unlike the Allison, it was highly efficient at high altitude. The result was an instant and dramatic improvement in performance. The Merlin actually delivered more power at 25,000 feet than the Allison had on takeoff. And it did it on half the fuel consumed by the Thunderbolts engine. The RAF and the US Army Air Force were suitably impressed. They placed large orders for the Mustang. It was agreed that the American-built Packard Merlin should become the standard engine for all future production. I don't think the Americans would have had that sort of fighter if we hadn't tactfully got in the Merlin. I think it's one of the greatest examples of, of cooperation between two, two countries in trouble. I think it shows that all those brilliant minds could actually get together and work together without jealousies. The final pieces of the Mustang jigsaw were put in place when the P-51D was introduced in May 1944. The new model was redesigned with a low-back fuselage and a bubble canopy of clear plastic, giving an unrestricted field of vision while creating an entirely new and distinctive profile. The Mustang was now a thoroughbred, the undisputed champion in the Allied fighter stable. Even on the ground, with its wheels down, it looked like it was going forward. It was beautifully streamlined. It, it had all the right contours, I guess. It looked like a fighter plane should look. And it has a sound all of its own. There's no sound for like the P-51. The Mustang is the pilot's airplane. You have to understand that. You climb into that plane, and that airplane becomes a part of you. It responded so well to the controls, and just felt good to fly. We used to say, uh, if you wanted to turn left, you roll your eyeballs left, and that was about all you needed. You were a part of the plane. It was as if you were a bird. It flew, 
beautifully. It responded perfectly. It flew with power and grace, and it was gorgeous to, to be in that plane and flying. I really think it was a love affair between uh, a young pilot and his airplane. We felt that we were uh, capable of doing anything we wanted to do in the airplane. The enemy was defeated in our mind when we crawled into the, into the cockpit. They had been given the most potent fighter in the Allied arsenal. It had the best engine available. Its six heavy machine guns, three in each wing, could unleash a total of 1,880 rounds. It carried over 400 gallons of fuel with two disposable drop tanks fitted under the wings and could fly more than 2,000 miles. To have been given a, an airplane like this, a P-51 Mustang fighter, as my own, I felt terrific. At last, the American bombers had the protection they so desperately needed. A high-performance fighter that could escort them all the way to Berlin and back. It was a turning point in the war. The Mustang, the P-51, the longest range fighter in the world. Speed, fast climb, quick dive, tight turn. Into these great fighters, America poured its genius, its millions of man hours of labor, its faith in victory against the Luftwaffe. And in their single cockpits, it placed these men. I didn't have the faintest idea what the hell was going on. I knew why we were fighting, but uh, I didn't know how. The first time I really realized that I was in combat was I saw my wingman shot up and going down. And I had never seen the enemy aircraft that did it. And I know at the time I thought to myself, what the hell am I doing here? I'm way out of my league. If they were to survive in combat, the young pilots had to learn, and learn fast. You still can feel your heart pounding pretty fast. And uh, yeah, there's some fear, the first mission or two, that how's this really going to go? <laughs> I was scared to death. And I'll tell you, anybody that says they weren't scared to death is a liar. I was new and nervous. And uh, with the gyrations of the plane, I, uh, I started to, my, I had to throw up. And when I got uh, back to Steeple Morton, landed, oh, I felt terrible. I, I felt maybe I, I didn't have what it takes. I felt humiliated. Came up to the hard stand, and the crew chief climbs on the wing, and the canopy goes back. And I saw him look, and I, I told him, I'm terribly sorry. I'm, I'm terribly sorry. I'll, I'll help you clean it up. And he said, look, I've seen worse. And I felt wonderful. It meant there were others, too. It wasn't just me. But those three words were a psychological turning point for me and I never threw up again. I felt I could do it. Each pilot depended on his crew chief. He led the ground crew that serviced and armed the fighter. They were all dedicated to the pilot's welfare, provided he looked after their aircraft, as well as they looked after him. The crew chiefs felt it was their plane. The plane was charged out to the crew chief, not to the pilot. And he took care of that thing as if it was a, a little baby. Right, he did everything but put a diaper on it. I'm still fighting with my old crew chief for 55 years as to who owned my airplane. You talk to a crew chief, he owned it. You talk to a pilot, the pilot owned it. 
He says he owned it, and you only fly because I let you. When the airplane is on the ground, it belongs to the crew chief. It's his airplane. And it's almost like a father with his daughter. And you come as a high school kid, and you're going to take his daughter out, you know? So he looks you over, and he checks you out and everything, and you're very careful. You bring my daughter back, and it's the same thing with the airplane. But when you climb into that airplane, and the crew chief and the assistant crew chief buckle you in, they snap on your harness, and the umbilical cord is tied, it's no longer his airplane, it's my bird. It was my girlfriend, it was my baby. The Mustang pilots liked to personalize their aircraft. Most were named, often in honor of wives or girlfriends back home. At that time, uh, Walt Disney's motion picture Dumbo had come out. And in Dumbo, there was a song that uh, the mother sings to, uh, to Dumbo, Baby Mine, Don't You Cry, so forth. And that song used to go through my head when I was flying. So I said, that's a perfect name. So I called Baby Mine. Then whenever I went out with a girl, they'd say, what did you name your plan? I said, I named it after you, Baby Mine. And it worked. Day after day, Huge formations of American bombers and fighters would set out to make the dangerous journey into German airspace. They flew from dozens of airfields dotted across the rural landscape of southeast England. We were sort of like a flying gun platform in a flying gas tank. That's what you were because every inch of that plane practically was loaded with gas and ammunition. As the air crews shuttled each day between the peace of the English countryside with its water meadows and thatched cottages and the full horror of modern airborne warfare, they shared a strange, disjointed life. Like Roman gladiators, they could be celebrating a victory one day and mourning a lost comrade the next. The only certainty was that each mission could be their last. I always knew I was coming back. It's always the old story of uh, there's a hundred fighter pilots in a room, and the old man said, this mission is so dangerous, only one of you is coming back. You'll look at all the others and say, you poor fellows. A fellow in my barracks had a chessboard, and he and I ran a, an ongoing chess game at all times. And we often said, well, this is to guarantee that both of us are coming back, because <laughs> we want to see who wins this chess game. And it's so random. You don't know where it's going to happen or to whom. We would really feel bad if we lost some of our people. And we'd often wonder what has happened to them, what happened. And in the debriefing, no one would really know. They just didn't come back, or someone would see them bailing out, or someone would see them going into the ground. But we never really knew what happened after that. He was there today, he was there yesterday, and he won't be there tomorrow. This was the highly charged world of the crack Mustang units, which the Luftwaffe pilots had learned to respect. They were certainly a tough bunch to meet in combat, and many pilots had notched up the five kills needed to qualify for the unofficial title of fighter ace. Being a fighter pilot in combat is always a matter of goals. You want to destroy your first enemy airplane. So once you've destroyed the first, then you want you're, you become greedy. You want four more to, so you can become an ace. Then 
you become greedier yet because now you want to destroy more than anybody else in the group. It's just a matter of wanting more all the time. When that P-51 engine turns over and each of the cylinders hit with one explosion after the other and a roar, you don't hear the noise, you feel it in your stomach, in your gut. You're strapped in tight, you roll up the canopy, you push the throttle forward, and you go. several mornings when we were escorting and the sun was just coming up. And it looked like a silver road in the sky with those bombers. It was an amazing sight, one that I'll never forget. A thousand bomber mission meant that there were 700 fighters escorting the thousand bombers. There were 10 men in each bomber, so that's 10,700 men that were flying in any one day. This happened on a daily basis. It must have been terrifying to look up and see 1,500 contrails that would whiten the sky as we swept in over Germany and watching for those telltale white streamers would be the German anti-aircraft gunners and fighter pilots determined to defend their homeland, whatever the cost. Flying several thousand feet above the bombers, the fighter escorts would weave to and fro constantly on the lookout for the enemy. If there's one characteristic that you need to be a fighter pilot, it's a neck that turns. If you're up there and flying at, say, 22, 25,000 feet, there's a heck of a lot of sky, and you're constantly looking around, not only to protect the bombers, but to protect yourself. We loved to see them escort, um, because we knew when they were around, we were not likely to get any fighter attacks, or if we did, they would be chased off in a hurry. But we thought the fighter escort that took us all the way to Berlin and back, that was really something great. Escort duty could be lonely work, with only the minimum of radio contact to break the isolation. You didn't hear swishing or anything like that of wind going by. All you heard was the noise of this powerful Rolls-Royce Merlin engine in front of you. And you hoped you heard that noise through the entire flight. The pilot would regularly switch between the Mustang's five fuel tanks, draining the external tanks first. They would be dropped before going into action. Escort missions could often last for more than six hours and pilot fatigue was always a problem. You were the only person in the plane, of course. You were the pilot, you were the navigator, and you were the gunner. When I got up high there, like 22, 23,000 feet, and I might not have, no one else was around, I had this terrible lonesome feeling with the earth way down there. When you get up at altitude, it's 50 degrees below zero centigrade outside that plane. And when you have an eighth of an inch aluminum between you, it doesn't insulate you. It conducts the cold into the cockpit. So it is cold. Numbed by the cold, dazzled by the blinding sun, and deafened by the roar of his engine, his senses were dulled. And it was easy to lose concentration. I think more than the fatigue, and I have to be candid about it, uh, was the, uh, the boredom, the actual boredom of flying a long-range escort mission and not getting any action at all. Because you'd often wonder, what am I doing out here, you know? 
Why don't these fellows come up? Why don't we get a little excitement going? Suddenly, the radio would burst into life with a shouted warning as the German fighters pounced on the bomber formation below. It was instant. We dropped tanks and went into them. We were supposed to defend the bombers. That was our responsibility. And we always attacked. We always attacked, no matter how many. To hit a moving target at speed involved complex but instinctive calculations by the pilot. It's just like playing football, throwing a pass. You just had to lead him and, and take a guess. And my marksmanship was good. Tenths of a second meant something. If you're going 400 miles an hour, that's 600 feet a second, OK? And in a tenth of a second, you're 60 feet away from where you were. That doesn't give you very much time to ponder what your next action is. You've got to do it in real time fast, very fast. The best way to do it is to fly up their button and let them have it. And that works every time. I'd say at least 50% of the time, the, the victim was unaware that he was being attacked. And, and that was the ideal situation for getting a kill, but you sneak up on a guy and doesn't even know you're there, and then you blow him out of the sky. We flew right under a flight of 109s. My wingman, Bert Stiles, was yelling, 109s! Let's get out of here. And I just said, don't panic, Bert. <laughs> he was fairly new. But don't panic. I pulled in behind him and I thought, boy, we're going to get something here. And Bert screaming on to me again, let's get out of here. Let's get out of here. He sees that there's another flight following that flight. And we're in between them. And I'm fat, numb, and happy until I realized that those sounds I heard outside the cockpit were not my engine backfiring, but 20 millimeter shells exploding. And then I knew Bert knew more than I did. And I slammed the stick over to the left and kicked the right rudder just as hard as it could to snap roll the airplane down into the clouds again. Got down below, everything's nice, peaceful down there. Once a running dogfight had developed, the odds were more even. Combat quickly became a confused series of chance encounters and narrow escapes. I looked to left, and there was an ME-109 shooting at me, coming through this break in the clouds. And you could see the black smoke coming from the wings as he was fired, but he was head on to me. I yelled, break left, yellow flight. Attempts to outdive an attacker often ended with a high speed chase at low level. With no chance to bail out, it meant almost certain death for the loser. He knew he was going to crash, so he pulled up trying to get altitude to bail out. and he didn't quite make it. The parachute didn't quite open, and, and of course, I saw him hit the ground. And that was a, a very, uh, well, it was a, a difficult moment, let's say. Then you realize those people are just like I am. You know, uh, he's, he's a fighter pilot, and I was too. All this happens in a matter of seconds. And that's a long time, seconds. The German capital, Berlin, was ringed by hundreds of anti-aircraft guns. As the bombers neared their target, they had no choice but to fly straight into the barrage of exploding shells. Now, the escorting fighter pilots could do nothing except watch. Even the Mustang couldn't fight the flak. 
Well, when you were on a bomb run, you knew that bombardier, his bomb site was controlling the airplane, and you knew that he wasn't going to take any evasive action. No way he could. And so you were a sort of a sitting duck. When I talked to fighter pilots, uh, they said, boy, I wouldn't want to be in your shoes. You know, you have to flying through all that flak. We don't, we don't mess with that. Then I say, well, I wouldn't want to be in your shoes either. But uh, it just seemed to me like the, what they were doing was a heck of a lot more dangerous than what we were doing. Once the bombers had delivered their deadly cargo, and cleared enemy airspace, the escort fighters could use up any remaining ammunition on targets of opportunity at ground level. Luftwaffe bases, road convoys, and supply trains were the favorite targets. We were authorized to go down on the deck. And then you have a lot of fun there. Anything moves, you shoot it. But ground attacks were highly dangerous operations. For every Mustang shot down by enemy aircraft, five were lost to ground fire. You come in over the treetops, you come up like this, and as soon as you came up, tracer bullets, all these red golf balls would be coming at you. My mind flipped back to when I was a little kid sitting in the dentist chair. I thought, it's not going to hurt long. And that's what I thought every time that I was in a situation like that. It won't hurt long. As the bombs rained down on German industrial cities, they tore the heart out of the Nazi war machine. We knew that we were causing a lot of devastation down there. And uh, it bothered me a little sometimes, the fact that uh, we sometimes dropped through an overcast, so we weren't hitting a military target. We were just hitting the city. And uh, I rather imagined sometimes that my bombs might be killing somebody that I'd rather not kill. The crack German fighter units that had once dominated the air war now found themselves running out of everything, from spare parts and fuel to serviceable aircraft and trained pilots. Toward the end of the war, they were scraping the bottom of the barrel. And uh, these kids, uh, I don't know how much training they had, but it was obvious they didn't have too much. So uh, like shooting fish in a barrel. And if it's the enemy, I don't mind shooting fish in a barrel. On the 14th of January, 1945, Mustangs notched up 161 kills. During a series of turkey shoots on the 16th of April, more than 700 German aircraft were destroyed, mostly on the ground. More than 80 aircraft were destroyed in a single attack on one airfield. Hitler's once mighty Luftwaffe was finished. I didn't dislike the Germans. I hated the son of a bitches. So that took care of a lot of my problems because uh, if I thought I could get one, I'd do a certain number. If I figured I could get a thousand, I'd have done a hell of a lot more. The Allies were now masters of the skies. And without fighter cover, the German ground forces were at their mercy as they steadily advanced into the very heart of Germany. Hermann Goering, the chief of Hitler's Luftwaffe knew only too well the part played by the Mustang in his defeat. When I saw the fighters over Berlin, he told his captors, I knew the jig was up. When the war in Europe finally ended in May 1945, the Mustang still played a crucial role in the Pacific. But its glory days as a long-range escort fighter 
were almost over. That was a hell of a plane. It was one of a kind in its day. I mean, it was the finest as far as I'm concerned. You'd never forget, I gotta tell you this. I think what it is, uh, uh, that was the, the only thing I've ever done in my life uh, that did anything for mankind. And so you never forget it. I dream about missions today. I dream about what I could have done, what I should have done, where I made mistakes, where I could have improved myself. I still dream about it all the time. In those days, there was a strong sense that we were fighting to save democracy without a doubt. We were all committed to winning and, if necessary, to sacrifice our lives. There was no question about it. People didn't draw back, even though they were outnumbered 15 to 1. 10 to 1, 15 to 1. That didn't hold them back. And if you don't believe in something, you don't do that. People have asked me, didn't you just hate it? And I say, are you kidding? I was 20 years old and they gave me this big, beautiful airplane. I had the time of my life. If you enjoyed this video, please remember to like and subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching.